17 years, we were founded uh, originally in D.C., but quickly moved up to uh, back up here to Boston because we needed creative types and we weren't finding them in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the numbers we wanted. And um, there. So, yeah, you can skip this slide. Why don't you... Well, and I guess one of the things that's really interesting here is that what we've really focused on is building robots that provide real economic value. Um, and that's not to say that uh, the fun robots, the artistic robots and that type of thing aren't really important. I believe they're incredibly important. Um, we have to make money too right now, so we're building robots that do work. And we're going to come back and talk about, uh, talk about that a little bit, but let's go to the video. So this is just a video background of what some of our robots do. Now, um, why robots? One of the things that uh, I think is really important is that we give ourselves time to be human. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a video a little bit later on about there's some jobs that humans just shouldn't do, right? They're, hu they're jobs that don't take any creativity. We're punching the clock. We're getting hurt. Um, we're not really bringing any value to the world, right? We've got this model right now in, in America, in the world in general, that we need, to produce, um, we need to produce economic value as humans, right? We have to contribute individually to the gross domestic product or we don't deserve to exist. Anyone ever feel that way? So you go and you do your job and you make some money, you pay the bills, but then why are we here ultimately? So a lot of jobs are perfect for robots, right? No one really gets excited about carrying boxes around in a sorting facility. I mean, maybe somebody does, right? <laughs> so any, anyone here really excited about spending their life carrying boxes around in a sorting facility? I'm not seeing any hands. So we now have robots that can do these jobs. Um, what, about, uh, what about robots, or, or what about, um, loading and unloading trucks, or um, what about some of the even rope manufacturing things where somebody has to build the same part on a lathe day in and day out, absolutely no creativity, right? Really, they're the robot. They're just following a set of instructions, doing again and again. Who knows, they're probably thinking about the game or when they can go out and, uh, and um, have a beer with their friends. So. We're building a lot of robots that can do a lot of these jobs. Um, we focus first at Vecna on building robots that can navigate successfully in unstructured environments. So up until now, most of the robots have, uh, that are used in industrial settings have required things like um, lines on the floor or beacons or that kind of thing. And in many cases, they've had to say, we're going to have this be a robot space and human beings are not allowed in this space because robots and humans, of course, can't work together, right? 
Um, we've all seen the movies in Hollywood. Uh, robots are the enemy. They're going to take over and kill us. So we, we need to uh, separate ourselves from them. So we've been working a lot on this idea of can robots and humans peacefully coexist and work together effectively. I'm going to talk a little bit about safety uh, when I show you the, the other video. Um, because one of the things that's really important, of course, is that we don't use people to do rope jobs, to produce product, and put their safety at risk and hurt them so that they cannot function or have a happy life for the rest of their lives. So um, safety is, is very important. One of the problems right now with adoption of robotics, of course, there's a perception issue, um, and there's a cost issue. A lot of times uh, it takes a little bit of extra money or effort to um, adopt a new technology. And a lot of people try and look at this question of, can we, justify, can we justify buying robots by reducing jobs? How many people can we get rid of in order to buy these robots? I don't think that's a particularly good way to think about it, and it's, it's certainly not um, telling the whole story, because there are so many jobs that humans just shouldn't be doing. And if you just look at some basic safety statistics, what you'll see is the cost to us as a nation and to us as a world in terms of safety issues, in terms of human suffering, um, easily pays for, if, if you, even if you just look at OSHA claims, Occupational Safety Hazard something, whatever OSHA stands for, um, pay, they pay for themselves almost immediately. So again, I don't think looking at the question of are we taking, you know, how many jobs can we reduce with this robot being, um, defining the value of the robot. <coughs> so we've really focused on making it so that the robots can navigate in these environments um, without uh, any extra infrastructure. And then what we're focusing on is now let's have the robots manipulate, you can see arms on here and stuff, manipulate things when it gets there. So the robot can move around in the environment and then it can grab stuff and unload load and unload itself, etc. Okay, so those are some of the robots. Um, let's move on. So this is one of the things I really want to emphasize. Vecna is a company that uh, was built around certain principles. Excellence, integrity, service. We don't have any outside investors or any funding for one reason, one reason only, because we believe in social responsibility. And as soon as you play the venture capital, um, all it is about is return on investment. Now, I'm generalizing. There's lots of great VC firms that have social responsibility as an important metric. But when it comes down to someone investing in a business, they're not actually involved in the details. They don't actually care about the customers or what the business is doing really much beyond how much money am I going to get out of it. That creates all kinds of perverse problems um, for, uh, for everyone, really. So from the very beginning, we decided we wanted to be a different kind of company, a company that made giving back to the community the highest priority a company where talented people could come, be creative, achieve their maximum potential, where we could solve, our, solve problems for our customers, provide real value. We have a philosophy that we haven't earned our customers' money unless we've provided real lasting value to their organization, and where we could also have a broader positive impact on the community and the world as a whole. So one of the things we do is we pay our employees to spend 10% of every single work week we don't force them to do it, but we, we offer them the opportunity to spend 10% of every single work week doing community service. We've done over 100,000 hours of community service so far. And uh, yeah, it's so tough. anytime I say that, because I think about not those hours, but I think about the people who have been impacted. I get letters all the time from families whose children have been um, ch their lives have been changed because an employee at Vecna has taken the time to help. So we're really proud of that. So one of the things that I always like to do is challenge everybody. Make community service part of your life. Go to your company, go to your HR department, and, and encourage them to make community service a part of your, your company's culture. Um, the research is unambiguous. This is, not, this is not ideas at this point. This is fact. People and companies that regularly engage in community service are healthier, happier, they live longer, 
They are more productive, they're more prosperous, they're more respected, more fun, etc. The list goes on and on. Community service is a very good investment. It pays back, and I think you all know that you always get back more than you put in. So um, take the challenge, make it happen. Okay, so what is this mass robotics thing? Um, uh, about uh, eight months ago, I was lamenting the sorry state of the robotics industry. Um, in its infancy, not really, and, and let me just be clear, when I'm talking about robotics right now, I'm talking about mobile robotics systems, not sort of the old-fashioned pick-and-place robots that are bolted down in factory floors, but this new age of intelligent robots that can move around and interact with human beings um, and, and help us do things. So I was lamenting the sorry state of the industry. We're not organized. We don't have standards. We don't have any suppliers that actually provide sensors and motors and parts specifically for us. So I started to get together with a lot of the CEOs in the area to say, hey guys, come on, we got to get our act together. And um, through those conversations, somebody said, you know, what we really need is a, is a place, uh, a creative space where these companies can come together and share ideas and not have to try and reinvent the wheel um, by themselves every time. Uh, there's something I call the shiny object syndrome, which has been really debilitating to the robotics industry, and that is that we have lots of really talented, creative people who come out of universities, for instance, you know, a PhD from MIT, so excited about technology, right? Technology is cool, and I want to build robots, and I'm going to go start a company to build robots. Well, the problem oftentimes is they don't really have a connection or an understanding of what are the real economic problems that need solving. So they'll go off and they'll come up with some idea about a robot to get beers from my fridge and bring it to me during the game, right? Amazing idea, not going to be a successful business. Not going to really push the needle in terms of relieving the human race from these dull, dangerous, dirty jobs that are killing people and freeing us up to spend time, more time being humans. So we started to put our heads together and we ended up saying, uh, realizing a couple things. So this is number one scary, uh, first scary um, fact. There are trillions of dollars of unmet market needs right now that will be met by robotics over the next several decades. So what does that mean in terms of work and jobs? There are very few jobs, very few manual labor jobs right now that we don't have the technology today, no additional technology needed, that we don't have the technology today to automate. So the point there is it's no longer sci-fi. It is just a matter of time. It is just a matter of the economic cycle carrying forward and using robots and automation to do a lot of these jobs. Now, a lot of people hear that and they get very scared. They're like, well, what are we all going to do? What is going to happen when the robots are doing all the work? And it's not limited to you know, blue-collar jobs. I was just talking to Dan, one of our mechanical engineers, at, at the beginning of this, and he was talking about how there was this survey about Will your job, what is the likelihood your job will be replaced by a robot? And um, you know, he was talking about uh, accounting being like you know, 80% or whatever. He said, you know, mechanical engineers was like 0.1%. I said, well, Dan, actually, Vecna had a contract from DARPA, a <coughs> Defense Advanced Research Pro Project Agency or Program Agency, um, several years ago to build an automated mechanical engineer. And, and here's the concept. I'm sharing it with you all. <coughs> You can use advanced simulation tools, right? Computers are amazing these days. You can simulate physical objects. You can simulate physical objects interacting. You can simulate two pieces of metal getting cut into two, piece, in, into two gears, those gears meshing and working as a mechanism. As soon as you can do that, you can start to have robots, machines, computers, design machines. Uh, it's a very simple concept. Now, a lot of work still needs to be done, but basically what happens is you start specifying not, you, you, don't, you, don't, you no longer look at building the machine yourself. You look at telling the computer what the machine should do. And if you can specify clearly enough what the machine should do, then the computer can use simulation, can go out on the internet, find all these parts, try them together, it has all day, right? It can just do cycles and cycles. It can try every crazy idea out there and find it and build a machine, basically, that does this job. And then you may say, oh, that's not what I was looking for. I really wanted one that was blue, and I want it to be less expensive, and I want it to um, be more cool looking, maybe a little sleeker. And the robot goes back to work. Anyone seen Iron Man, right, Jarvis? Again, we see these things and we think it's a crazy concept. It's not that crazy. 
I was talking to a bunch of Girl Scouts last week, and one of the Girl Scouts... <laughs> that was crazy. You guys are, you guys are great. <laughs> I was getting interrupted every two seconds. Um, but uh, one of the Girl Scouts, you know, we are talking about how today we're superheroes. We are all superheroes. Just stop and think about it for a second. A couple of decades ago, could you pull a device out of your pocket and answer just about any question anyone could pose to you and have an almost authoritative answer, right? You guys are geniuses, right? That couldn't happen. That was unheard of, right? Wikipedia, um, you know, Google, you can search for something. You can get the answer. Um, communicating with people across the world with a the, with the small handheld device. Anyone remember Dick Tracy, <laughs> right? That was, that was total fantasy, never going to happen. These things are happening. So one of the Girl Scouts gets her hand up and she says, yeah, but um, we're never going to be able to read minds, right? <laughs> military's already doing it. Now, if not doing it maybe the way you would think, but the military has a helmet that they can put on that has some probes, and another soldier has a helmet with probes, and by training their minds to think certain thoughts, they can telepathically send messages to other soldiers. Why might that be useful? Well, you know, making signs and, and talking out loud can give the enemy perhaps uh, uh, information about your location. So they're building technology that allows tele telepathy between soldiers. It's all happening. So yeah, mind blown, I know. Um, so I got a little off track here, but uh, so we decided, <laughs> we decided that we need to get together and start to organize. This robotics thing is happening. And, and when I say robotics, I really talk, I'm talking about technology as a whole. It's going to change the way the world works. Now, when I was a kid, I had the uh, opportunity to um, spend some time at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I got to meet Edward Teller. Anyone know who Edward Teller is? Father of the hydrogen bomb, right? A very controversial figure. And, um, you know, I. My, my conversation with him left a very strong impression on me. And this isn't fair to him, so I'll just state that up front, but the impression it left on me as a young person was, his response was, well, somebody was gonna build the hydrogen bomb. So, damn well better have been us to build it first. So we just had to do it. Kind of the idea was, it was gonna happen anyway, so we just had to do it. Stop thinking about it. This is not a philosophical, moral question anymore. We just had to do it. And he was probably right. He was probably right. Who knows, had we not been the first to develop the hydrogen bomb, the world could be a very different place. Maybe worse, maybe better, who knows. But the thing that that left me thinking is, just because something may be inevitable, just because something may happen, may be um, uh, almost, almost definitely going to happen anyway, that does not relieve us of the responsibility to think carefully about the implications of what we're doing. And um, I believe it's very important for, for us to take that point of view and for businesses to take that point of view. We can't think about how we can just extract money from the economy. What we need to think about is how are we improving the human race? How are we making life better for people around the world? How are we sharing prosperity with everyone? We've got this problem, of course, of increasing divide between the wealthy and the poorest people. So what does all this have to do with mass robotics? My thought was, this is going to happen anyway. And there is going to be a region on this planet that is the center of activity for robotics and automation. That's where it's mostly going to happen, because these things happen in clusters, right? The Internet, Silicon Valley, etc. If we can own that, if we can be that here, we will have more opportunity, sort of the Edward Teller thing, but we will have more opportunity to influence and control how that impacts the world, how that impacts people around this planet, um, so that we can try and do everything we can to make sure that this is a good thing and not a bad thing. Now, there's sort of two extremes, right? If robots are doing all the jobs and there's nothing left for anyone to do and we haven't figured out how to change our economic systems to make that okay, then really one of the only outcomes that you can think of is massive unrest and revolution. Right? It has happened before in the history of this world. It is not a crazy idea. Um, 
On the other end, the place I like to be is this should allow us to actually focus on some really cool stuff that matters and to make sure that we take care of everyone because we can produce all the food we need. I think it was about 70 years ago, it used to be that something like, um, boy, I'm going to get these numbers all wrong, but something like 60%, maybe it was 70% of workers in the U.S. worked in agriculture. They were farming. They were out there trying to produce the food we needed to survive. Any guesses on what that number is today? It's like 2 or 3%. 2 or 3% of the people right now produce all the food we need. And in the U.S., the amount of food we waste is absolutely embarrassing, actually. It's, it's crazy. Um, so we need food. We need shelter. We need a couple of other minor things to survive. Um, so when all of those things that we need to survive can be provided through technology, do we use that as an opportunity or do we allow it to make us fall apart as, as a society? That's an important question. So let's zoom through these slides because you're probably not super interested in the details here. Um, but the bottom line is this one is important. Um, just really quickly, go ahead into the next bullet. Um, trillions and trillions of dollars of unmet market needs right now that will be filled by robotics. Okay, next slide. Yeah. I have just a question. Mm -hmm. Think we, you make reference to Americans, to the society, to all human beings, to some people Humans. Okay. Human race. Thank you. Yes. So right now, uh, Massachusetts does have the world's largest cluster of robotics um, universities and companies. Um, there is a shift right now, um, a little bit of a shift to Silicon Valley, simply because that's where the money is. That's where the investors have made big returns and are looking for the next big thing to invest in. Now, here in Massachusetts, we have a very strong comparative advantage. We have a, manu uh, a very strong manufacturing infrastructure, um, a, a history in uh, computers and, um, and medical, and a lot of these things that come together to um, be a great place to do robotics. So our goal is, can we leverage this and make sure that Massachusetts, that New England, the U.S., and then um, you know, to the world is the place where we can um, uh, really grow, nurture this, and help to raise it in a way like a child, send them in the right direction. Okay, next slide. Not interesting. <laughs> Said that. Uh, lots of great places here to be creative. I love that. Next slide. Um, yeah, so not interesting. <laughs> not interesting. Not interesting. Not interesting. Uh, lots of people behind it. Or to direct, not interesting. Okay, that's nice. Uh, so let's do this. <laughs> okay, next slide. Next slide. Um, so I want to talk a bit look about this uh, barriers to adoption. People think robots are not safe, and I'm going to help you understand that uh, that uh, has some validity to it. Let's uh, see uh, jobs that people shouldn't do. 4,585 workers killed on the job in 2013 in the United States. 4,585 workers killed on the jobs. Now. How many of those do you think were jobs that that person really wanted to do? How many of those people do you think were doing jobs where they were being human and expressing creativity and helping people and those type of things? I'm guessing probably not a lot of them would be my guess. 188 billion in productivity and lost wages every year. That's a lot of money. And uh, forklifts, fork trucks, number one. So let's see the video. Bad stuff, bad stuff. Uh, there's, this is, the first one is actually slightly graphic, so if you have a queasy stomach, you might close your eyes. How are we doing on time? <laughs> this is what I was talking about at the beginning. This guy is probably doing the same part day in, day out, day in, day out. Mind was probably wandering, and he made a mistake and it almost killed him. He's not happy. 
See this guy right here? See that fork truck driver right there? Oh. Oh. The fork truck driver didn't even realize he had run over somebody. He keeps going until this guy runs out and tells him to stop. This is really bad, guys. Oh. Oh. Barry. Oh. This is real stuff. This is not Hollywood. <gasps> this guy was probably crushed. <gasps> Those fork trucks are heavy. When it lands on you, you don't get up. I don't even know what this one's about, actually. But I'm pretty sure this guy was probably not excited to go to work in the morning anyway. N not a job that humans should be doing, probably. <coughs> So you see, these things are just unsafe. People make mistakes. People get hurt. Just crushed a guy. Yeah, he doesn't look too hurt, luckily. This guy's very lucky almost impaled himself on that. He would have not survived if he had been a few centimeters to the... Oh, no. Do you see that guy get thrown out of there? <laughs> this crazy stuff. There was no door here. He just made a new door on the side of the building. <laughs> Alright, is there anyone left thinking that there are some jobs that humans that, that humans should be doing these type of jobs. Be bold. Raise your hand. I want to hear it. I'm, I'm curious from a safety perspective of that statistic of the 5,000 people in 2013. How many of those were in positions or um, opportunities of input that could easily be replaced by the robots? Probably, probably a large number of them. It'd be interesting to do that study, actually. Yeah, question. I, the same number, I'd be curious how that number might change if you looked at long term damage done, uh -huh. cancer, yeah. being things that are caused long term by. I mean, it, it feels, and, and it lines up with directly the question you're asking. It, it feels like a slippery slope when we think about sustainability and, and our workforce and the number of people we have, the number of people who have to eat and provide for families, and if these jobs go away, yep. what happens to those families? Exactly. It's a very important question, and that's the question, that's the question I want us to start talking about. <laughs> I'm not sure what he was thinking. Because <laughs> I've driven a forklift, and it is, it's fun and frightening at the same time. So think about the cost here. That one mistake that could have been prevented by having a machine do that job <coughs> instead of a human. But, I mean, machines are infallible, right? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's many situations where having a machine that just has a few sensors on it can prevent catastrophe. Think but about. Don't you make that same argument for better training or safety standards being implemented in a lot of these situations? Well, yes, I think, that, uh, I think that there's a lot of ways to address the problem, so I don't want to make a blanket statement, but... Um, why, are those, why are some of those safety things not on those machines, like, like a self-driving, or not a self-driving car, but a car would have the parallel parking yeah, yeah. integrated? Yeah, yeah, perfect. I was just going to make that example, right? So now cars are coming out, and if you are driving down the road and you get distracted by your text message because somebody just tweeted about this awesome event, and you look down for a second, and somebody slams on the brake in front of you, right? A modern car now will, oh, look at that, we have a slide on it. <laughs> we'll stop the car for you, right? Same idea, same idea. Now, why isn't on there yet? Just because of the time it takes to adopt things in, into industries, right? Everything has to be driven by cost. What is the return on investment for this? And this is one of the big reasons I'm talking about safety is because the problem is a lot of times industries look at this question is, well, what am I going to get for putting these sensors on? How many jobs, how many people can I get rid of? 
And that's the wrong way to look at it. Whereas, of course, the automobile industry is trying to sell cars based on things like, you want a safe car, buy ours. So there's a little bit of a different economic dynamic there. Um, you had a hand up. Yep. Um, along with what Josh just shared about like proper training and safety practices, as another former operator in some of those industrial environments, and with training, like the more things like these, um, the warnings and automa automation of cars and things like that were further encouraging less responsibility on the operator's part. Yes, as well. yes, that's a really important point, and we talk about that uh, quite a bit. Um, the, his point is that when you start putting these these safety systems in place to prevent humans from killing each other, humans become more reckless, mm -hmm. right? They they take less responsibility. It's a problem, right? And, and where do you where do you draw that line? Now, you know, I talk to a lot of the a lot of the people who run these big places and it's hard to find workers that they can train, invest in training and have them stick around for a long time is a big problem. They have people that show up to work drunk and you know there's all kinds of problems and challenges. There are lots of people who show up to work every day, do their training, do a great job too. That's probably the vast majority. But um, it's problematic and so the question is are they showing up to do this job because it is fulfilling for them? because it's what they want to do, or they pissed at their boss, they're pissed that they have to go do this job every day, and damn if they are going to do anything more than they absolutely have to to collect their paycheck, right? Rage against the machine and all of that. Well, it's this, it's this cycle. We need to figure out how to break out of that cycle. Yeah? Isn't there a middle ground here where to add robotics without necessarily being fully autonomous? Like, the, where do you see the role of yeah. sort of remotely controlled that's exactly the point. Don't get rid of people. Let's let's create systems that have all the sensors and the autonomy capabilities you need to prevent the accidents. But you're letting the worker um, you're letting the worker do the job. But when they're about to back into somebody. The, the truck stops or the truck beeps or it helps them. So the idea is sensorize these platforms, give the humans tools to do their jobs better, and then over time we may, this, what, what this really does is it provides immediate economic value, it saves people's lives, it <coughs> saves cost, and it buys us time to figure out how to adjust our economics so that people can, people are the point, so that people can survive and thrive and be creative in a world where they don't have to go do a sucky job in order to be able to put some food on the table for their family. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, are, are we going to we open forum at this point to ask uh, questions? Apparently we are. It's ten. Ten. So you asked about time and it's 10. Let's see if there are any more slides that are interesting real quick. So yeah, that back one. So this is an example of where we have a sensorized platform. The human can still do everything, but it will prevent that person from, I mean, not infallible, right? They're gonna make mistakes too, but it will, it will help that person do their job better. Now, over time, that person may say, well, why the heck am I driving this thing all the way over to the charging station? That's boring, it can drive itself. I'm gonna hop <laughs> off and press the button and let it do that part because there are no people around or whatever. But, um, so that's what we call the safety to autonomy curve. Let's, let's introduce robotics, let's, let's pay for it for the safety, and then we can introduce autonomy as we buy ourselves time to figure out how to make this be a good thing for people rather than a bad thing where we're just replacing workers and not letting people provide for themselves. Yeah, and that's my question was specifically around, you know, like the Google event yesterday, they were talking about all the different wearable devices in the safety to autonomy curve. Are you factoring, I mean, does that sort of factor in wearables as part of this? Yeah, yeah, all, all, all of it. So um, a, a, a few years ago, one of the researchers at Vecna told me something that I call the Hoffman paradox. So Dr. Hoffman um, said, when I was a kid, my dad pulled me aside and he said, Andreas, when you're working, you're only going to have to work four days a week because of automation. Your children are only going to have to work three days a week because of automation. Their children are only going to have to work two days a week because of automation. 